Good morning from the Johnson Space Center here in Houston. I'm Dan Hewitt. Two Expedition 39 astronauts are getting ready to go outside and do a spacewalk to replace a failed backup relay computer. Here to give us a status update and walk us through the spacewalk, we have uh, Mr. Mike Seferdini, the International Space Station Program Manager. He'll be joining us from the Kennedy Space Center down in Florida. Here in the room, we have Brian Smith, International Space Station Flight Director, who will be uh, overseeing the EVA as it comes up. We also have Glenda Brown, the lead spacewalk officer for EVA 26. We'll start off with opening remarks from each of them, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, why don't we start off with Mike Seferdini down in Florida. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this uh, press conference is supposed to be about the EVA, but we'll talk about uh, what's uh, most immediate in our future, and that is the launch of the uh, Dragon spacecraft out at uh, Launch Pad 40. Uh, the the uh, Falcon rocket itself uh, has been uh, repaired since uh, the uh, discovery of the um, orifice issue in, um, during the last launch countdown. That's all been repaired. Uh, we put uh, fresh science on board, uh, buttoned it up, and uh, rolled out uh, last night. The vehicle is uh, currently at the pad, and we're counting down to a launch at 325 uh, this afternoon local time. Uh, of course, the big, uh, big question mark is the weather. Uh, I think we're still at about uh, predicted to be 60 percent chance of no-go uh, as a result of weather. Uh, however, um, a big part of the challenge is just getting out there and being ready in case a hole opens up. Uh, and so that's where we're at. That gives us the best chance of success. And in fact, uh, once this little frontal boundary uh, passes over, there's a pretty good chance we'll, we'll potentially find a hole uh, in the weather and, uh, and get off the pad. If we don't make today, then we'll, uh, we'll do a scrub turnaround for uh, 24 hours and, and try tomorrow uh, about 23 minutes earlier. Uh, that does affect the EVA plan. Uh, if we launch today, the plan is to do the EVA on April 23rd. Uh, we'll launch Dragon, we'll birth Dragon on the 20th, um, about 7 in the morning Eastern time. Uh, and then uh, we have some research we need to get started on, so we'll open up the hatch, we'll get the research started, uh, and then we'll get things configured uh, for the EVA. We also have a Progress 53 Progress that has to depart as well, so the crew will get up in the morning, we'll get the Progress on its way, and then we'll conduct the EVA. Uh, Brian and Glenda will talk to you in detail about the EVA, but I will talk a little bit about the uh, where we are from a, a risk posture standpoint. Um, the uh, EVA, since we had the anomaly um, a year or so ago uh, with Luca on board, uh, we have been working diligently to understand the cause of the anomaly and to recover from that cause. Uh, but in the process, we have done a thorough review of all of our uh, processes and procedures and our hazard reports, and we established a goal for ourselves to have all of that work done uh, before we did a uh, planned EVA. Uh, however, uh, the vehicle keeps flying and keeps operating, and, uh, and occasionally we have contingency EVAs. We've uh, done one of those already, as you know, to do a pump module uh, replacement, and, uh, and we're prepared to do uh, this one uh, for this uh, EXT uh, MDM that has failed. Uh, from a risk standpoint, <clears throat> we better understand the cause of the anomaly. Uh, the anomaly is, uh, is due to contamination that was uh, likely introduced uh, by a filter that was used to clean the system. Uh, we have since uh, scrubbed all of the suit's uh, water lines and removed, basically we re we've replaced the water or flushed the water uh, three times and all three of the suits on orbit and the cooling lines in the station that uh, provide uh, cooling and water to the suits. Um, in addition to that, uh, we've of course replaced the filters now. We have good filters on board. Uh, we have replaced the uh, fan pump SEP uh, that got clogged up in um, EMU 3011, which we used for a previous EVA, the, the pump module EVA, and we just did uh, the fan pump SEP R&R &R for suit 3005. And so the team is going to recommend to the mission management team here next week uh, that we utilize those two suits. Uh, and they've been prepped and, uh, and they're ready to go. And I'm sure Brian and, and Glenda will have more to say about that. Uh, one of the, uh, the challenges with these suits is to, to understand the water chemistry. And we're learning quite a bit about water chemistry in the suits and the sensitivities and the contaminations that can be scrubbed out and those that are very, very difficult to scrub out. Uh, so in this process, we have become quite um, 
uh, I would say, uh, more adept at, uh, at figuring out how to uh, keep the water clean and the significance of, of uh, certain constituents in the water and, and, uh, and their uh, effect on the suit itself. So as part of the process that we're going through to uh, continue to plan DBAs, we're updating all of our hazard reports. And of course, we need to do our final failure analysis and, and conclusion for the anomaly uh, to make sure that we've uh, repaired all of the, or, or chased all the possible uh, fault tree branches uh, to a complete closure. But again, uh, the uh, preliminary Im information seems to point to the filters. Uh, those, of course, have been removed and replaced with, uh, with good filters and the water's been flushed, uh, and so we've reduced the risk uh, back down to an acceptable level. Uh, so we have great confidence with the EBA that we have planned. It'll be a relatively short EBA. Uh, Rick and, uh, um, and Swanee will go out and do the EBA, excuse me, uh, and, uh, and Koichi will help them get ready to go out and, and um, manage the EBA from inside the, uh, the ISS. Uh, so with that, uh, that's all my opening remarks. We're ready to go both for the launch today uh, and for the EBA on uh, whichever day is, uh, it turns out to be required. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Mike. Brian? All right, good morning, everybody. Let me give a brief overview of what we're talking about with the computer failure. We refer to it as the external multiplexer demultiplexer or EXT MDM as, as we refer to it. To put it in context, there's 46 computers on just the U.S. portion of the space station. 24 of those are external. And of those 24, this EXT MDM controls 12 of them. So it's, it's very important. We have two of them. We run one at a time, and we always have one in backup. Last Friday afternoon, during normal operations, we powered on the backup EXT MDM and attempted to, the intent was to load some files to it uh, we do this periodically based on the operations that are going on on board ISS. We had issues with this MDM powering up. Uh, we spent Friday afternoon and Friday evening attempting to get it to power on, boot up correctly, and communicate. Uh, we were unsuccessful, at which point we declared the MDM failed. Late Friday night, the ISS program directed the Mission Operations Directorate to initiate a Team 4 effort. Most of you are probably familiar with the, the terminology Team 4 because we just did this uh, back in December. Team 4 efforts are started when there's a serious problem on space station that needs to be solved in relatively short order to uh, put the ISS in a better risk posture. And so the Team 4 will consist of all engineering operations, all support personnel necessary to solve the problem. The team makeup will vary depending on what the nature of the problem is. I've been leading this Team 4 effort uh, since early Saturday morning, and the teams have done a fantastic job trying to figure out how to solve this EXT MDM problem. As Mike alluded to, this isn't a, a long EVA. Uh, there's certainly EVAs that are more complicated uh, than this one. Uh, however, the real trick has been to figure out how to put this EVA in the same week that we're doing the Dragon mission and we're doing the 53P progress operations. Each one of those individually has its own constraints, its own systems configurations that we need to, to account for. And we know how to do each one individually. And we usually keep these events spaced apart. In this scenario, though, we need to execute them relatively close to each other. And that was the real challenge for Team 4. We were tasked to go figure out how to replace this EXT MDM as quickly as possible. Uh, at the same time trying to fly this Dragon mission in the presence of the next worst case failure. The next worst case failure in this situation would be loss of the one remaining EXT MDM that we have. So I'll, I'll briefly describe what would happen if that were to be lost so you understand the criticality of going and replacing it and why we need to do this spacewalk in short order. So if we were to lose our remaining EXT MDM we would lose our ability to control our solar array rotary joints, our SARGES. We need to control those, one, for power generation, but also there's a large number of constraints on these solar arrays. We don't want to have thrusters pulling them when vehicles are coming in. We don't want to erode or contaminate them. And so there's a number of constraints that need to be satisfied, and we always put these 
solar arrays, we always command these sarges into a particular position. We lose that capability. And so the impacts would be to things like Soyuz dockings, undockings, progress dockings and undockings, Dragon missions, Cygnus missions. Uh, and so it's imperative that we maintain the, the fault tolerance on these EXT MDMs. And right now we don't have that. Some of the other issues we would run into uh, is being able to power on redundant equipment that's on the outside of the space station. A large number of the commands that are required to turn on and off our redundant equipment pass through an EXT MDM. And without that, we lose our ability to activate these, the, the other equipment. We also lose some insight and command capability into our external control uh, thermal loops. So these are what we talked about back in December when we had the loop alpha problem. Uh, the loops will continue to run without an EXT MDM and we have all the failure detection and isolation and recovery software in place. We just lose our ability to see the telemetry and to change the configuration. Uh, so because of these impacts, this particular failure was put on a list of critical failures that we would respond to quickly and we would go do an EVA for. And a lot of the work was done up front for this EVA and we were able to capitalize on that when we started our Team 4 effort. Throughout the week, the teams have worked extremely hard. We've worked very long hours and we've come up with plans that would accommodate not only this EVA, but also the Dragon mission, as well as the progress operations. And we've come up with uh, two different plans depending on when, when the SpaceX launch occurs, whether it occurs today or tomorrow, we have those plans ready to go. All right, over to you, Glenda. Okay, to give you a few more details about the EVA itself. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the crew members. Our EV-1 is Rick Mastracchio, and this is his ninth EVA. Uh, He's already got logged 20, I'm sorry, 51 hours and 28 minutes. And uh, then EV2 is Steve Swanson. We call him Swanee. Uh, this is his fifth EVA. He's logged 26 hours and 22 minutes on his previous EVAs. Altogether, we've had uh, 178 spacewalks up till now, maintaining and building the International Space Station. This will be our 179th. Brian mentioned a lot of crew mem or a lot of team members working together to uh, pull together all of the plans. Uh, the work started uh, several years ago when we identified that this was a critical spare. Uh, we formed the failure response um, action teams or FRATs, and it's a bunch of engineers that get together. They review all of the documentation and then they prepare all of the work that would come prior to in development of this EVA, right down to the very last stuff that we need to do. Um, that is specific to this uh, particular event on this particular day. So most of the work, the hard work was done for us and now it's just packaging it all together and, uh, and putting it together into one EVA. Uh, we'll be assisted uh, during the EVA uh, by uh, uh, Ground IV Jeremy Hansen. I'm supported by a number of people uh, gathering all of that information from the host of engineers. Uh, in my back room, uh, we'll have Sandra Moore at the task console. We have Sandra Fletcher at the EMU console. Reagan Cheney is our airlock support, and we have uh, Greer Wilt helping all of them out. They'll be gathering all of the inputs from the t team uh, that need to be um, gathered during the EVA. If there's a response that the crew needs, uh, we've got a lot of people standing by uh, to provide that information. So let's go ahead and uh, run the video uh, so we can see uh, just what we're going to be doing during these EVAs. Go ahead. So our EVA to repair the XMDM or external multiplexer demultiplexer will begin as we always do at the Quest airlock. As you can see here in the center of the photo, we egress through the airlock at the Nader hatch. Um, EV-1 will exit the airlock first. That'll be Rick coming out first. And uh, Steve will follow him out. Uh, between the two of them, they'll manage the hardware that they're bringing out. We're showing several bags here, but what we really boiled down to now is just uh, the one uh, ORU bag containing the MDM that will translate to the work site. They're gonna carry all their other tools on their persons. They'll translate up the CETA spur, up to the handrail, up to the S0, Phase one uh, and work along the CETA handrail. Phase one is where the uh, mobile transporter that holds the SSRMS is normally parked right over the top of these MDMs. We've moved that out of the way and it's at worksite two now. 
they'll be uh, getting into position, uh, stowing the bag that's got the ORU in it, uh, stowing any other tools that they bring with them that they want to have handy. And then Rip will get into position uh, in a heads down position in front of the MDM. There's the MDM right there and we're going to, rather than not show, rather than show him over the top of the box, we'll leave him out of the way for the purposes of this video. Uh, when they get to the work site, they're going to look around and see if they can find any damage. If it's daylight, we'll take some photos. Uh, if it's darkness, we'll go ahead and proceed to get the work done. Rick will get into position and uh, uh, remove the uh, handling tool or the uh, scoop. We call that an, uh, a scoop because it looks like an ice, uh, an ice cream scoop. Uh, he'll uh, remove that and then he will drive the three bolts that are on the front of the MDM. I've got the MDM here in the room and I'll show you that when we're completed with the video. Uh, Steve will be standing by and helping him out with access to any of the tools that he needs, uh, taking anything away from him and stowing it. Uh, here we have him just handling the scoop to give you an idea of, of uh, how he would be moving things around. Um, so. The scoop gets installed on the front of the box. Uh, we've decided to bring it out, uh, installed on the front of the, uh, the ORU bag and we'll install it here onto the failed unit. Um, we have to drive the bolts first before we install the scoop and so it'll be ready to pull right on out as soon as we, uh, we drive those bolts. We'll temp stow it out of the way and we uh, picked a nice safe spot that we'll most likely use down inside the truss. We'll tie it off to a handrail there so it's out of the way while we do the work with the new box. Uh, there'll be an inspection of the cold plate and the bracket that holds the blind mate connectors which I'll be showing you in more detail um, afterwards. And um, then they'll access the new MDM out of the ORU bag. Steve will help out as needed uh, to hand that off to Rick. Uh, they'll be inspecting both the uh, new ORU and the cold plate one last time before they uh, slide the two together. Um, again, it's got three bolts, so um, we'll just uh, install the center jacking bolt first and then use the other two uh, tie down bolts to hold it in place. If we should have any trouble with other, the, any of the, uh, either of the outside bolts that hold it in place, um, we'll be uh, uh, we'll be good to go with just the center jacking bolt. That just uh, provides some extra security to the box. Um, then we take the uh, scoop off of the new ORU, uh, stow it uh, for return to the airlock, and then uh, pack up all of our tools, uh, pack up the ORU bag, and uh, do some final inspections. If we haven't had daylight when we first come out, we'll take the photos at the end of the work and uh, then uh, pack up everything and come inside. The trans, oh, I'm sorry, we have to pack up the uh, ORU, the f uh, failed ORU goes back into the ORU bag before we can uh, come back to the airlock with it. So grab the bags and head back inside. We follow the same translation path that we come uh, um, out to the work site on to return back down to the airlock. So you can see it's a pretty simple uh, EVA um, in terms of the overall work that we have to do. Uh, it's just coming out to the airlock, driving three bolts to remove the failed unit, uh, removing it, temp stowing it, and then uh, in installing the new one. Very straightforward. Uh, at the end of the EVA, they'll come back inside and, uh, and we'll be done. So now if we can uh, look at the, uh, at the MDM that I brought with me. So uh, this is what the size of the box looks like. Um, the one difference is uh, this mock-up is for a new box that we're going to be installing next summer on an EVA and it will not, the box we're working on does not have this electrical connector. That is an upgrade uh, for the new system that will be installed uh, uh, next year, summer of 2015. Uh, so the the uh, bolts that I mentioned are right here at the bottom of the, the ORU. Uh, it's got the two tie down bolts here and then the primary bolt which is in the middle, that's the jacking bolt. So in order to remove it, you release the two outside fasteners first and then drive the bolt in the primary bolt. And what that does is you drive that bolt out, it screws the box just a little bit and it'll slowly drive the box out and then once it's free, they can pull it out of the, 
out of the uh, work site. I'm gonna set this here for just a moment to talk to you about what the work site looks a little bit like. This is a, one of the uh, plastic mock-ups that we have from the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, so it's not exactly flight-like, but it does give you an idea of how the installation works. So when you look at the uh, installation bracket, the blind mate connectors will be inside this bracket here. And those will mate with the ones that are on the back side of the MDM. So the MDM has mat mat mating connectors, electrical and power and data um, to in the back of it. The, uh, the uh, cold plate that it's mounted to uh, is right down here. And then it has these three wedge locks that are at the back of it. And the way it works is when you slide the two together, you can see there's pins that are on the ORU that go into the, to the slots right here. There's four pins that'll just slide into those slots. And then as the two come together, the wedges that are on the cold plate interface with the wedges that are on the, back, uh, the bottom side of the ORU. So this is actually a wedge. And then as you put the two together, The four pins go into the slots, you put the two together, and then the wedges come together in the back. As you drive the bolt, when it gets to the wedges, the wedges drive uh, next to each other to put a nice preload onto the bottom of the box so it's very firmly mated to the, um, to the cold plate so that it gets good, cold, good cooling. With all the electronics in the box, there's quite a bit of, of heating that builds up there and we need to make sure that it's got good thermal conductivity with the cold plate on the box. So that is essentially uh, the EVA and I can answer any of your questions. All right, we'll go ahead and start uh, with questions. Uh, a reminder, we have Mr. Stufferdini tied down from Kennedy, so if you could please state your affiliation and who your question is for, it'd be much appreciated. We'll start here at JSC, then we'll go down to Kennedy and then we'll take questions from our phone bridge. So, Gina? Uh, yes, how long has that box been up there? So it, w it came up um, uh, with the trust that uh, was launched, and I want to say it's a lot around, the, is it 11 years? April of 2002 it launched. Okay. STS 110-8A. It was launched in place with the trust. And you have how many spares? Uh, we have just the one spare that's inside. Um, but within the box itself, there are cards, just like in your computer at home. So if there's a failure of any one of the cards, uh, we're intending when we bring that failed unit back inside uh, that we'll replace the card that's failed, and then that will be a good spare for us in the future. Okay. Okay. Mark. Thanks, Mark Corot, for uh, Aviation Week. Um, this might be for Mike Separdini, um, but it might be for Brian, too. I don't know. Uh, what are the plans for the Progress 53? When does it leave and come back? Okay, so 53P, there's three aspects to that operation. There's going to be a prop purge on the 19th. On the 23rd, it's going to undock, and then it's going to come back and redock on the 25th. And uh, may I ask a question on the uh, MDM? Do, do you know why, why it failed yet, or is that a follow-up to retrieving the old box? So we don't have the exact cause yet. Because the box didn't power on properly and it isn't communicating with us, our insight into it is extremely limited. We have a power signature to work with, but we can't trust the data because we don't think the box is communicating to us. And so that's the extent of what we know right now. We've exhausted our troubleshooting options. Uh, we'll see if we're gonna troubleshoot it or not. Uh, we've got spare cards, and so, you know, the quickest posture back to a, another spare might just be to change out the cards and, and then test it. Yeah, I'm, uh, Jim Overt of NBC, a couple of short ones. On the box, what's, what's the approximate mass of it in terms of handling? It's approximately 50 pounds. It's just under that. Okay. Where are they stored inside the ISS? Um, the spare MDM is stored inside the lab. It's been there for the last 13 years. Not in the, not in the closet. Okay. You were going to talk about uh, EVA dates in case of uh, no launch to today or tomorrow. Uh, was there some discussion if we didn't launch today or tomorrow that we do the EVA sooner? Uh, what, what dates are you looking at? So the team four looked at this in, in great detail. 
It was very important for us to understand all the constraints of each operation and make sure the ISS was put in the best risk posture in all scenarios. What it boiled down to is if there is a launch, successful launch today, the EVA is on the 23rd. In all other cases, the EVA will be on the 20th. Sunday. Correct. Correct. Okay. So today pushes the 23rd, otherwise, no matter what happens, it's on the 20th. Thank you. Jim. Sorry, we gotta move on. Go ahead, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to you time. Okay. I think that does it for in here, actually. We'll come back for follow-ups uh, at the end. Uh, why don't we go down to Kennedy now, and again, please state your affiliation and who your question is for. Um, yes, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press, probably for you, Mike, since you're here. Um, why, um, I know you have the uh, the material on board, the Dragon, to use for the spacewalk, if you can get it there in time. Um, why not wait for Saturday's spacewalk to get the material, and if you don't get the gasket-like material, what are you using between the box and the uh, coal plate? Uh, so it's as uh, time has progressed and we've gotten a little closer, the launch is getting a little closer to the uh, to the EVA and our plan, we've actually decided to go ahead and use the material we have on orbit. Now, the material we have on orbit is the correct thickness. It's not quite cut uh, uh, the same. Uh, and so uh, the team has decided we go ahead and we had determined before we even loaded the uh, the material on the Dragon that we could live with the one we had on orbit if we had to. So in the interest of time, today actually, we're getting the MDM modified. The crew's put in the, um, we had to put in a new card and the MDM that's gonna go outside in order to get the right boot up software in there. And so we've uh, we're just about done with that. Um, and then we're gonna check, the, check it out, the, the box using a, a piece of hardware we have on, or on board. And then we're gonna remove the old coal therm and uh, put this modified coal therm. And that's just a timing thing now. When Dragon shows up, are, are we're going to be very occupied with uh, getting the research started, and uh, and and that takes about a day or so, and then we're going to go right into the EVA preps, and so we wanted to have the the MDM all ready to go, so we didn't have to do that at the last minute. Did you pull it off the Dragon, the original repair part, or are no, you just going to let it fly? We just let it fly. Okay. We'll, we'll need it someday. Okay, thanks. Okay, next question down at Kennedy. Next question down at Kennedy. Yeah, Bill Harwood, CBS News, with a couple of quick questions. Um, when you said you replaced, you're replacing a card mic on the spare MDM, I, and then I assume you've you're tested this. This box will have been tested thoroughly before it goes out the door, just because it's been there so long. Right. That that was part of the effort all along was to check out the box, but we realized that it had a set of boot code software on it that wasn't gonna. We we were gonna be able to work with with the new version that we're up to now on ISS since it's been on board for so long. So the easiest thing to do was take a card we already had and just plug it in. Okay. Almost all these MDMs are interchangeable. The cards are interchangeable inside. Okay, and a quick one for Brian. You were going through the list of things that uh, would happen if the Prime if EXT one failed. Um, I'm give, I'm assuming that given all the procedures you put in place for fixed solar array angles and things like that, there are no power downs that would happen if that failed. Is that right? It's just a matter of you'd lose some telemetry and insight into the external thermal control system, but you wouldn't have, to, would you have to power anything down if the prime went down? Thank you. That would be assessed on day by day. Of course, that answer is dependent upon the beta angle. So if we have no primary EXT MDM, the solar arrays will eventually stay in, in auto track. The SARGE specifically would stay in auto track for 24 hours. At the end of that 24 hours, they're gonna go to a preset angles, we call those the null angles. We have control over what those angles are and we've been very strategic about how we set those angles for this upcoming week. But once they get into those null angles, then we just rely on our PGAs, uh, the beta gimbal assemblies to rotate and, and generate power. And so we will have to assess uh, day by day as the beta angle changed and our power generation capability changed versus what it was we needed to accomplish on ISS and it would be quite possible power downs would be required. To the extent though, it would all depend on what the situation was. And I would also add, we're low beta right now, which is good for us power wise. So we're, we're, we're pretty flexible in, in terms of, of how we'd manage power if we got into that position. And it's just, we're just lucky because of where we are beta wise. Okay, next one down to Kennedy. Okay, next one down to Kennedy. Uh, James Dean, Florida Today. Mr. Safdini, sorry if I missed this, but I'm um, just wondering why 
he wouldn't uh, use this opportunity to, to stay out a little longer and, and get a few more things done uh, during the spacewalk and you're just limiting it to this one task. Yeah. Right, well that, that goes back to a number of things. One is uh, we're, we want to get this job done as quick as we can and so we didn't want to add a whole bunch of other things for the team to go sort out. Um, but also we've, we've made the commitment that we're not doing planned EVAs and uh, tasks that aren't critical uh, until we get all of our uh, hazards closed and, and uh, get a final closure on the, on the failure of the suit. So a short EVA actually from a risk posture really really reduces your risk. We're very close to the airlock. Um, two hours and 30 minutes I think is the time for the EVA. Uh, and so that, that really minimizes the risk to the crew. Now again, I'll tell you, I feel pretty strongly that we've sorted out the root cause and that our suits are in pretty good shape, but we still have some work to do uh, to finish uh, preparing the suits for, for long-term use for planned EVAs. And, uh, and so uh, just to keep everything at the right risk uh, posture, we've chosen just to go do the job we have to do for this critical um, repair and then get the crew back inside. Okay, thanks. And uh, just kind of big picture, we're seeing now another contingency EVA after a couple, a few months back. And I just wondered if you could kind of characterize, um, does it just sort of look like there's maybe th more things are, are breaking and there's an increase in, in uh, you know, the need to go out and do these kind of things? Or um, is this pretty much just in line with expected failures that you, you know, the failures you'd expect and, and things are still, um, lasting as, as long as, uh, you know, you want them to? You know, uh, logistically, things are doing very well. Um, we had uh, planned, and if you uh, look at our logistics and, and our uh, supplies on orbit, our plan is always assumed that uh, we'd have to do something on the order of six to eight EVAs a year. Uh, and so uh, we're well below that on average. Uh, although we, of course, these two contingencies are, are uh, and, and the other contingencies we have, every time we have them, uh, we go, uh, you know, we sort through that and we, and we plug that data back into our logistics support analysis we do every year, which essentially ups, updates the mean time between failure for all of our hardware. And then we use that data to determine if we have enough spares on board. But overall, I would tell you uh, the program has been, uh, um, much more, the systems have been much more reliable than their initial mean time between failure would have suggested. Uh, and we've, from a failure standpoint, we've been, uh, I'd say we're below what we, what we planned for. Hi, uh, Jared Hayworth. I'm here with the NASA Social and I'm a photographer with wehadtoday.com. It's a question for you, Mike. Um, one of the most highly publicized payloads on board the Dragon are the legs for Robonaut 2. Can you tell us what steps are remaining to allow Robonaut to be, you know, in place to go out and perform an EVA and do this repair rather than sending out the, um, the human astronauts? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, it's, we have a, quite a ways to go. Uh, the legs are the first step in figuring out mobility, um, and they allow mobility. There's quite a bit of work to be done uh, from, a, from a software standpoint to, to create a a uh, robot that can move uh, freely uh, anywhere you'd want it to on a station and then conduct those tasks. That's, a, that's an enormous uh, software challenge and really that's what Robonaut is. It's a, it's a great big software test bed. And, uh, and so these are great first steps, but um, if you look at something like uh, the uh, Dexter that we use on orbit. Today, Dexter, when we tell Dexter to do something, we have to tell Dexter specifically where to go, and we have to give it basically coordinates and plug it into a system that the, that the coordinate system that the system understands so it can go to where you need it to go and do the job you need it to do. It's, it's, a, it's a software intensive effort. Um, but we have very specific things for it to grab a hold of and very specific uh, interfaces on board station that it can go to. Something like a Robonaut theoretically could uh, walk down handrails, interface with a number of uh, sockets or adapters that you have on orbit and use a number of tools that you may, or, that you may have on orbit. Uh, and that would add to the complexity of, of the software system to, to operate. Uh, outdoors, but the team is off uh, developing the mods necessary to make a uh, Robonaut um, externally compatible, let's call it. Uh, I think the battery pack may, might have to get a little bit small, I don't know, but with the battery pack and the legs and the mods for external, then from a hardware perspective, you'd be ready to go. 
but like I said, I think the long pull in 10 is software. But that's the main reason why it's up there is to see can you can you get a robot uh, ready to go to save the the risk that you basically assume when crews go outside. They won't ever replace the crews, but they could they could do a lot of the jobs. I think that uh, you would you would from a just an or you change out standpoint, that's something you could probably get a robot to do for you. Ian Cluft with the NASA Social Group and also uh, AirlineReporter.com. And uh, so question about uh, today's launch for the, uh, the SpaceX CRS-3. Uh, looks like quite a significant front coming in on the weather radar. Uh, and uh, so I wondered, uh, do you have, uh, uh, do you know the points in the countdown preparations that are sensitive to weather and particularly lightning in the area? Uh, you'd have to ask the, um, SpaceX guys that specifically I sat with them last night and I um, from a from a strike standpoint um, they are they are protected with their catenary system that's around it and it has to do with the amount of energy that it will find its way back into the vehicle uh, if a strike occurs um, and so if you look at a 30 percent chance of lightning the actual chance uh, that they'd have a an impact at an energy impulse into the vehicle big enough to cause retest based on their calculations last night uh, was something on the order of one percent so it's a it's a pretty low likelihood that you that if there was lightning in five miles predicted at thirty percent that you'd actually have a vehicle problem or at least something you have to go test for um, th but if they have a constraint or when they stand down uh, launch operations i don't know specifically if that exists and what that number is um. Marsha at NAP again from you, Mike. Um, is the Dragon bringing down any, is it still planning to bring down the Parmitano suit? I can't remember what, if any of that bad space suit is coming back. I know it's working. So it's DVA and it's not coming home. 3015 so comes home. It had a sublimator failure early. Uh, I don't remember now. I think it's a couple years ago now. We've been waiting to get it down. But that's the suit we're bringing home. 3011, we, we changed out the fan pumps up and mm -hmm. all of its filters. Uh, and it's one of the suits we're sending outside. So there's no parts from that that incident last summer that you're waiting on t for the investigation? No, we've gotten those okay. parts are home. They're we've, home and they're taken apart. Okay. We've looked at them. We've also brought other suit parts home and looked at okay. them. So we, we have a pretty okay. good insight okay. into the to the to what, what it causes the suit to do. And how much longer do you think it's going to take for this investigation? And when is that series of spacewalks planned later this year that you had mentioned earlier for late summer perhaps? Yeah, yeah. we have it penciled in for July. So that's that's we're trying to get all of our uh, hazard work done and close the final legs of the fault tree um, by July. If there's anything hanging out that's critical for, from a safety perspective, then we'll push the EVAs. Uh, James Dean again, and um, I, I'm just wondering. It seems like Steve Swanson just just practically got there, and I was just curious if there was any limits on you know how quickly a crew member could be approved to to do EVA. Um, are there ever any concerns about, you know, just the adjustment to microgravity and how ready they'd be able to do that? Or, or um, I don't know, it's probably been a month or something that by now, is that, was that never an issue for this EVA? Uh, it's, it's days that we try to make sure the crews uh, have a little time to acclimate uh, on orbit uh, before we, actually we try not to um, give them a full work workload for, for a, a few days in order for them to acclimate and get going. And generally speaking, they get going a lot faster. I mean, they, they acclimate a lot quicker than we necessarily plan for. I don't remember if we have a specific constraint to go outside, but if we leave it to the crews, they go outside when they arrive. So uh, EVA is a pretty big deal. So uh, the crews are always ex ready to go if we ask them to do it. I don't know if we have a specific constraint, but we can, we can go look at that for you. Yeah, Mike, and just as long as you're here, I'll ask you a, a Russian question. How are things going with the Russians, given everything that's going on in the world? Have you guys seen any impacts at all in how you're dealing with them for ISS or anything else? Thank you. Uh, not at all. Um, and that, I believe, is the strength of um, a partnership and endeavor like this that involves human space flight. Is it, uh, it's the stability when everything else is getting a little crazy. But... Um, uh, our uh, work with our Russian colleagues and their work with us has uh, never been better, and uh, and um, and it's clear to me that that's by direction of both governments. So we're, you know, it's it's uh, it's understood to be very important, and it hasn't affected us at all in terms of how we work together. All right, that'll do it for questions from Kennedy. We'll go ahead and go to our phone bridge real quick. Uh, let's start off with Charles and News 92.
Okay, I think we lost Charles. Why don't we go to Denise Chow from Space.com. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I think this is for Mike, and I, I think Marcia may have touched on it, and I'm, I apologize if I missed it, but do you have a tentative um, timeline of when you might get back onto your regularly scheduled EVAs, and after EVA 26, what's sort of the main priority? Yeah, I told Marcia it's penciled in for the July time frame. And uh, however, if we're not done with all of our work, then we'll move it to the right uh, to make sure we have all of our work done before we uh, do planned EVAs. Uh, and I, f I feel pretty confident we'll get all of our work done, but it's a, it's a pretty tight schedule. Um, in terms of work after EVA 26, you mean the work we need to do to be able to go outside? Just um, what sort of the main priority outside that you would need to address after EVA 26? Oh, I see. Uh, well, we have a number of things we have to go do. We have some uh, cameras we need to uh, rearrange to get good views for the SSRMS. We have reconfiguration work. This is probably the biggest thing that's coming up. We have reconfiguration work to do uh, because eventually we're going to move the PMM, which is the pressurized multipurpose module, uh, the big storage module that's on the Nader port of Node 1. We're going to move to the forward port of Node 3. Uh, and then uh, make that the Nader port of Node 1 a backup berthing port. Um, and then we're putting the two docking uh, ports on ISS 1, uh, Node 2 forward, and Node 2 zenith. So there's quite a bit of work we have to do to get the ISS configured um, to, uh, to first move uh, uh, the PMM, which we need to do before we uh, bring up the... Um, we call them the IDAs. These are the uh, docking adapters. We call them the ISS docking adapters. So before we can bring the docking systems on board, we got to move the PMM. Our commitment is to have the docking system uh, on board and installed in 2015. Uh, so if you back up and look at all the things we have to do to get the ISS configured to do that, um, we've got to get on with these EVAs. There's a number of other uh, repairs and things we want to do when we're outside, but the, the biggest line of things we need to get done is all the reconfiguration work we need to do to uh, get the ISS ready for docking. Okay, next we have Elizabeth with Universe Today. Can you give us a sense of what sort of, uh, this is for Mike, can you give us a sense of what sort of uh, changes have to take place in order to make sure that you could do the EVA in between the progress and the, and, uh, the Dragon? What kind of changes need to take place? Saying that one of the challenges of planning the spacewalk was trying to um, getting the getting the task together in between all the other tasks that the crew had to do to get ready for the drag and also for the progress. Okay, I got you. Well, you know, Brian could give you this in song and verse. He he was the one that was uh, given this task to go do. I would tell you though that. Um, it's it's an enormous amount of work uh, for a team to do, and and you add on top of that, I mean, it's already hard enough when you've got a, a dragon sp that's trying to launch and you got a progress that has uh, the Russians have plans to leave and come back. Uh, then you decide you have to do a contingency EVA, and your suit is not um, already necessarily um, ready to go do the EVA. So now you've got a lot of work to do to not only get the suits ready, but to do the extra work to make sure the suit system is okay, plus find a hole, plus plan for a launch and a backup launch and a backup backup launch. Uh, so yes, we've, we've, kept, we've kept Brian off the streets with this exercise, him and his team. But maybe Brian would want to add uh, specifically the kinds of things he's had to do to deal with this. Some of the key things we had to look at first was, was the crew time. There's a certain amount of crew time associated with the Dragon operations, prepar preparing for the capture, the actual capture, the berthing, and then of course the critical science, which you would get to the, the next day. You have to ingress the vehicle and get that science started, and some of that science will also be conducted the following day. The EVA timelines also have a lot of preparation work for them. Uh, in addition to getting the suits ready and buying down that risk, we had to get the MDM ready. And as we speak, the crew on orbit is preparing that spare MDM. And because we had to change out the processor card and we have to deal with the co-therm on it, it wasn't a straightforward preparation. And it took the teams a while to put that together and then find a hole in the timeline for that to occur. As far as 
the Dragon Ops and the EVA progress, one of the biggest challenges was finding solar array positions that would accommodate all those. I mentioned earlier, each one of those has its unique set of constraints that will drive our Sarges to be in a certain position. Now we have to find spots with the Sarges that are, can accommodate all of them and in the presence of the failure, if we lose the EXT MDM, we want to control where those Sarges go. One set of angles is good for one event, another set of angles is good for another event. We had to find some type of common plan that minimized the risk associated with losing that primary EXT MDM relative to the Sarges, the constraints associated with those in the power generation. We also looking from relative trajectories, the spacing of the, the Dragon Ops and the Progress Ops was something that needed to be looked at very, very closely. Uh, we look at the nominal trajectories. We also look at off-nominal abort trajectories. Make sure we can keep everything safe, not only from the ISS, but for vehicle to vehicle as they come and go. So at a high level, those were some of the challenges uh, associated with trying to put all these operations within the same week. All right, thanks, Brian. Let's go to Stephen Clark with Spaceflight Now. Hi, thanks, Stephen Clark with Spaceflight Now. Uh, just a couple of questions uh, for Mike. Uh, First, uh, can you go into a little bit of discussion on um, when's your drop dead last uh, launch attempt for SpaceX before uh, moving on to the Orb 2 mission? Um, uh, in, in the case, uh, this launch gets tied up with some weather delays. And also, if there's a scrub today, not to be pessimistic, but um, it, it, do you have to uh, go in and service any research payloads before tomorrow? Thanks. Uh, okay, well, the, the answer to your first question is we haven't decided yet. Um, we have uh, today's attempt, tomorrow's attempt, and the 22nd as options. <coughs> I believe we have the 25th uh, as a possible opportunity. Uh, and then after that, we got to sit down and, and uh, talk to folks and decide uh, what, to what to do next. Uh, of course, in SpaceX's case, it's not just when you can launch, it's when you can land and there's a finite period the vehicle can be on orbit and we have landing constraints uh, that try to protect, uh, the, well, it protects the spacecraft, protects the FAA windows for the aircraft flying in the area and also we have a certain amount of constraints for payloads uh, back to the dock uh, time. So all those play a factor. So when we're trying to decide when to launch, we're trying to make sure that we have um, adequate windows for landing. Uh, so after the 25th, we'll uh, probably sit down and, and uh, have a long conversation if, if the Dragon isn't off the ground uh, at that point. Um, your question about the backup, if we go on, uh, on the 19th, we will not um, uh, resupply any of our research. The Dragon will stay buttoned up. Uh, that does have a uh, effect on a couple of our um, uh, research items, uh, but being in the grand scheme of things, it's um, it's the right risk trade to to make since we really need to uh, get the rest of the logistics um, on board ISS. And in both cases, it's a it's a um, I'll say it's a it's an impact, a potential impact, not necessarily a given that it's a that it's going to. Um, be unusable uh, research as a result of the delay. So um, uh, this is why we choose to go ahead and take the backup date. Okay, moving on, we got Irene from Reuters. Hi, thanks very much. I have two quick ones for Mike. Um, the first is um, on the EVAs, are snorkels and helmet pads still required? Yes. Thanks. And the other one is um, on the failure analysis on the uh, MDA, MDM that's returned. Will that all be done on orbit? Or are you planning to return any of the pieces um, on Dragon if you can? Uh, I don't know about returning on Dragon, but um, as Glinda said, uh, my preference is to change the uh, failed component and keep the MDM up there uh, and then we'll bring the component home. Really, the box is about 13 years old. Uh, it's not a, 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 it's not like this, this failure is, uh, is shocking to have occurred at, at some point given its age. Uh, so we're not, we're not looking at it like it's an indication of some big, bigger uh, issue, but we will take it home and, and do failure analysis on it. 
Uh, but what we'll try to do is just to R and R the card. So we put the MDM will be back as a, as a good spare, as Glenda said, and we'll bring that card home. And, and uh, in due course, we'll uh, we'll do failure analysis and see if it tells us anything. Okay, I think we have one quick follow up here in the room. Corro <coughs> Aviation Week, and uh, as for Brian Smith, you certainly mentioned the the power and the thermal. What are other concerns if you if you lost uh, another MDM? Other systems on the station that are are you know high order. So I'll give you two two examples. We have two S band strings, communication strings. Uh, and that carries the command telemetry and voice. Our ability to power up that backup string, which normally we keep off, requires an EXT MDM. So one of the preemptive measures we took right after we declared the backup EXT MDM failed. While we still have a good EXT MDM, we started powering on all those redundant systems. Rate gyro assembly is another one that's used in our guidance and navigation control system. We normally wouldn't power that on. It's there as a backup. So those are types of things that we we have on right now. Uh, the uh, the helmet camera that we're going to use during this EVA. Those radios outside are normally off. We require the EXT MDM to turn those on. So we turn those on right away. Once the MDM was declared failed, we knew we were destined for an EVA at some point. So we turned them on while we could. Okay. Uh, one one last one from Jim. Uh, from, from Mike. Uh, this is uh, Jim Ogre from NBC on the uh, bigger issue, program issues. Uh, you, there was some talk that you would be looking at the previous replaced ORU, that uh, the pump module and possibly repairing it on orbit. Is there any status you can give us on that? And can you give us a status on any uh, explanation from the Russian side on their, on their hiccup on the 4Rev, on the, the six-hour rendezvous that they had to abort? Uh, any re have they given any reasons for that? Thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, Jim. Let's see the four orbit. Uh, uh, the um, I'm sorry, the six hour rendezvous abort. Um, that was uh, ultimately turned out to be an energy issue uh, that uh, ended up having the um, vehicle making a maneuver taking too long to get itself into the maneuver for the burn, and it aborted the burn. Uh, they've taken some lessons learned from that because ultimately the, uh, the lower energy was due to um, uh, within family performance of the vehicle. And, and so the Russians have gone off uh, to make themselves more robust against uh, the band of potential um, energy results from the from the orbit uh, insertion and and the on orbit burns so it really overall the vehicle performed uh, n within the nominal range but the constraints were so tight for getting into attitude uh, from a fitter standpoint uh, that they didn't take into account that they could be in a position where they didn't quite get to attitude quick enough and so they've opened up that window and um, and we believe future launches won't have this particular problem. Of course, folks all know that uh, we do uh, both the six orbit and the 30 34 orbit, the six hour four orbit, and the 34 orbit rendezvous. We plan for both of those. Um, and if we plan for the 34 as a backup uh, while we plan for the four orbit rendezvous. So um, this was well within our, our plan. And your first question was? On the last condition, contingency EVA, the uh, crew replaced the pump module, uh, and I understand it may simply be an electrical problem in the module that you may be able to repair on orbit and have it have the full unit back as a spare. Yes, um, that is. Uh, we're assuming that to be the case. The team is uh, has some ideas about how you put uh, this valve uh, on a QD in between the line to the pump and the pump itself, and then we can. Uh, we can um, jumper in the into the connector that goes to the module so that that valve can operate um, uh, separate from the failed valve inside. Um, but I haven't I haven't gotten a recent status, Jim. We have we have some time to work this 
um, given the number of spares we have on orbit. But the team is off looking at that. I just haven't had an out brief yet. Uh, we have not turned on um, Boeing to go build uh, this this mod kit yet. Uh, I know that for a fact. So, uh, but I hadn't gotten a briefing recently on it. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for us today. Thank you to all of our briefers. A couple quick programming notes for you coming up. As always, you can tune into Space Station Live every day at 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern uh, for all the latest on life on board the International Space Station. Uh, more immediate, we have our launch coverage of today's SpaceX mission uh, going on the air at 1.15 p.m. Uh, on NASA TV. That launch schedule is to take place at 2.25 p.m. Central today. And assuming a launch today and a spacewalk on April 23rd, our NASA TV coverage will begin at 7.30 a.m. Central. As always, you can get all the latest updates on station news on our website at www.nasa.gov station. Thanks for joining us today.